the Ukraine conflict um, drags on, and um, I want today to step back from it to try to get a little bit of a bigger picture on what all of this is doing to America's place in the world. Now, America's place in the world hasn't been that secure for a couple of decades. It's always more insecure under Democrats um, for reasons I'm going to go into. Uh, but it was going down even before Ukraine. Uh, Biden has been, you may say, unwinding America on a number of different fronts, continuing in this respect something that Obama was doing for two terms. And uh, But I think the Ukraine conflict may be the turning the inflection point. And, um, and I'll say a word about that in, in a moment. Now, here is um, Vladimir uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, who seems to be trying to whip everybody up into a kind of, let's call it a World War III frenzy. Uh, and he's doing it by using World War II rhetoric. Let me just quote him here. And there's a, I have a tendency here to chuckle a little bit, which I guess is not appropriate. But here he is. We will fight till the end at sea in the air. I mean, this is a kind of pathetic evocation of Churchill. Uh, who in the dark days of Nazi advance uh, said, in effect, we will fight them in the hills, we will fight them here and there and everywhere. And uh, here is a guy, Zelensky, you know, an admirable fellow in that he's fighting to defend his country. But let's just say he's no Winston Churchill. And more importantly, the analogy is a false analogy, because even though the United States was very slow to get into the World War II, in fact, it took a Japanese direct hit uh, on America, on uh, Pearl Harbor, for America to get in the war, that was a war that did directly engage America's vital interests. Why? Because after all, the Nazis were overrunning pretty much all of Europe. It's a, almost a miracle that they didn't crush a British opposition. They did, of course, overrun France. Uh, they overran a number of other countries. And um, the United States, I think, could and should have gotten into World War II even, even earlier. But uh, Ukraine is a completely different situation. This is a country that's on uh, the periphery, not of America, not in our backyard, in their backyard, in Russia's backyard. And um, Ukraine doesn't make anything particularly vital that we want to buy. Uh, Ukraine is not strategically located in such a place that it's essential to the defense of America or of crucial American allies. Uh, and so it, um, not to say that we shouldn't sympathize with what's going on in Ukraine, not even to say that we shouldn't give them aid, including lethal aid, uh, which uh, we have been giving them. I believe the um, Congress uh, just approved another um aid package that was pushed through on a bipartisan basis. But uh, what I'm getting at here is that um, I think that the neocon sort of strategy for push pushing the Russians back, the, the latest example of which is an article by Elliot Cohen in The, um, in the Atlantic, he outlines a kind of a three-part strategy that he thinks is going to work. And he seems rather giddy uh, that this is um, going to be effective. His first point is um, the, um, um, the support of the Ukrainian forces through uh, lethal military aid. So he's not calling for the deployment of troops, but he is calling for more lethal aid. And this is a version, I have to say, of the Reagan doctrine, which is to say, let the Ukrainians fight, we will help. And uh, that is his uh, strategy number one. Now, I think even if we give lethal aid, when you just look at the relative size of Ukraine and Russia, there is no way for Ukraine to win that war. Uh, just as there's no way, for example, for Taiwan by itself to beat China. It's just laughable that they could do that. Now, can they discourage an invasion? Can they make it expensive for the Chinese to do it? Can they increase, in this case, Ukraine, the cost on Putin of the war? Yes, I think all those things are true. Uh, number two, sanctions. Now, sanctions, again, are effective only if they have the effect of shutting down the Russian economy and shutting down Putin's ability to make effective war. 
in the Ukraine. I'm far from convinced that that could happen. It does look like Biden reluctantly has finally said, OK, I'm not going to buy Russian oil. And I'll talk in the next segment about where he wants to get the oil, not from here where we have it, uh, but apparently from some other places which happen to be Russian allies. So the stupidity continues. Uh, but coming, uh, completing the Elliot Cohen article, uh, he finally talks about, you know, the and, and, and this to me is the, the silliest point of all, the kind of um, moral power of universal condemnation. In other words, the idea here that, that Russia is now making all these enemies around the world uh, and all these countries are drawing themselves to their full height and saying, we disapprove. We're not, we're not going to be um, supportive of this. Well, first of all, this is a theatrical move. Half of these countries are still working with Russia. Um, they, uh, you know, let's take China, for example. China says things like, we're, we're really hoping for a negotiated settlement. If the Chinese were religious, they'd be like, we're hoping and praying for a religious settlement. They're not hoping and praying for anything. They're actually sitting back and chuckling because this is a war that, A, the Chinese and Putin concocted together. Putin even kind of got clearance from Xi as to when he could do it. And so, I think it's time here to think about the bigger picture, and the bigger picture is the um, unwinding of the American century. Now, the American century, some people think the American century is the 20th century, but no, America didn't actually become a, a superpower uh, until the end of World War II. So if you're counting an American century, I think you'd have to date it from 1945 to, to well, maybe to 2022, to now, which is another way of saying that the American century lasted really 75 years. Um, and it began in the middle of the last century. And we can almost date this moment, this uh, conflict, as the, uh, as the end of the American century, which is not to say that America doesn't remain a powerful force in the world, not to say America is not one of the main powers, but it is to say that America is no longer the sole superpower. Many things will happen going forward without America. And this presumption that we can kind of call the shots, that there's going to be um, a negotiated settlement in Asia, we're the ones who are going to be brokering it if there's a peace in the Middle East, can happen without the United States. I think these things are now things of the past. We will have to look wistfully back to the days when America was top dog, because now we're just one of the boys along with other countries, Russia, China, Brazil, India, and so on.